That old lady in the hat over there, she's looking at your skirt. I knew it was too tight. And yes, everyone saw you trip on the curb. You shouldn't have worn those shoes. Someone probably recorded it. You're gonna be a, neat, a viral meme on TikTok in three, two. What a grotesque quirk of human evolution that our anxiety manifest itself as an obsessive, chatty, disgruntled attention whore. During a period when the voice in my cerebral cortex was particularly loud, I began my journey to uncouple myself from this bully. Untethered Soul, The Journey Beyond Yourself by Michael Singer was recommended to me. The sappy title and ethereal book cover seemed too pious to be taken seriously, but I bought the book anyway. In it, Michael explained that there's an asshole in my brain masquerading as me. <laughs> he insists that this is not cause for alarm, which is alarming nonetheless. How do I know that this belligerent voice isn't me? Yeah, you're gonna listen to some guy who sits in who has an international bestseller, but sits crisscross applesauce on the floor doing what jack shit for hours when he could be partying it up in Ibiza. Let's eat some ice cream and watch some TV. It took me a while, but I started to notice the difference between me and the voice. It felt like the moment I realized there was no boogeyman under the bed. It shifted everything I knew about self-determination. Within a year of reading the book, I was on a flight to my first meditation retreat in the outskirts of Kansas City, Kansas. <laughs> the lesser of the Kansas cities. <laughs> I spent the next 10 days at a modest country estate built in 1893. It was drab, but in a noble sort of way. The building housed a kindly contingent of Christians who welcomed anyone looking for solemnity in the pursuit of a higher calling. They didn't care what you called God, but they did have a giant Jesus statue located off the freeway to sway people toward their point of view. When I told my friends that I was voluntarily committing 10 days of no, no entertainment, no speaking, and a strict vegan diet, most were dumbstruck. At the time, I worked as a fashion editor. Most nights, I attended parties or was dancing at nightclubs. I was an omnivore who ordered extra bacon at brunch and enjoyed lavish dinners. I had a separate closet just for cocktail attire. The retreat was an impulsive decision that I almost immediately regretted, but I couldn't get my deposit back, so <laughs> I decided to suck it up and seek enlightenment. <laughs> this is going to suck. Stuck in a room with weirdos, sitting on floor cushions, passing gas. You won't last a day without your phone. What if somebody dies? What if it's really a cult? That last question worried me a little. <laughs> but my real worry was being locked away with only my thoughts for company. My boyfriend at the time meditated for hours to deal with his depression. He said sitting in stillness brought him glimpses of profound peace. Yeah, well, he also had that road rage meltdown on traffic on Tuesday, <laughs> so maybe it's not working. <laughs> Stillness and peace sounded good to me, though. But in hindsight, maybe I should have done more research. Signing up for a group known as Mid-America Dharma was dubious. No one ever called the group by its acronym, but really, did no one consider that before they registered a trademark? <laughs> it was only after I arrived that I saw a wall of historical building photos, including patients in beds and some secured two beds, that I realized our home for the next week and a half had once been a home for the mentally ill and those stricken with tuberculosis. 
the asylum <laughs> closed at some point in the next 100 years and the property was purchased, but not renovated much. The cramped institutional rooms were the perfect austere environment for a vaguely religious room and board. Are you fucking kidding me? We're in an actual asylum, like in The Shining? Are you insane? Well, clearly, you've done some dumb shit, but this is top 10. These people look weird. Are those harem pants? <laughs> I guarantee you there will be a creepy set of twin girls in the hall later. <laughs> Truthfully, even if I'd known it had been an asylum, I would have signed up anyway. <laughs> I was desperate and intrigued by the descriptions of what meditation could do to improve my life. I knew that it had the ability to tame the voice in my head, as well as improve my memory, skin, productivity, health, and sleep. But I also knew that that wasn't the goal. Meditation is designed to end suffering, but it isn't meant to do that by offering gifts of clear skin and improved digestion. But telling people to sit quietly in a room to learn about how their existence is not unique and all their plans, pains, and accomplishments and shortfalls are ego-driven hubris, not many folks would sign up for the rude awakening retreat, <laughs> myself included. Instead, I focused on the hope that meditation might cure my chronic insomnia. At night, I'd lie awake, well, Another day closer to death, and what did you do today? Ate too many carbs, did some half-ass exercise. Those dishes in the sink aren't gonna wash themselves, you know. Did you volunteer for a political action committee? Write Congress to tell them how fucked up the new Supreme Court ruling is? What a waste. Everyone at the retreat had their own small private room. A twin bed, dresser, chair, lamp, but no phone, no radio, no clock, no TV, and no books allowed, not even a journal. The communal bathroom was down the hall. And no, I didn't run into any kids obsessed with red rum during my stay. <laughs> Almost no one talked for 10 days except for our meditation teachers. It was suggested that we not even look at one another as we passed in the halls for meals. To look at someone is to reach out for connection. Validation that we exist, that we are seen, that we are not untethered in this world. The retreat wasn't trying to convince us that we didn't exist, not exactly, <laughs> but it did present evidence that our shitty lives were not worth obsessing over. <laughs> A teacher told me to stop fighting my raging thoughts and instead work to change my perspective. I imagined standing in the middle of rush hour traffic, cars swerving around me, veering erratically at high speeds, horns blaring. Then I imagined standing on a bridge looking down at rush hour traffic. The traffic didn't change, but my heart rate did. I never stopped the torrent of thoughts, but lowering the volume on the self-critical and paranoid running commentary became easier. For instance, I discovered what happens to an itch that you do not scratch or otherwise resist. Sitting in stillness, eyes closed, patiently, non-aggressively observing an itch is an experience few people are familiar with with good reason. <laughs> it's a sensation that leaves you 99.85% sure that something venomous, grotesque, or loathsome has found its way up to your neck and is about to bite into an artery to implant the poison of a slow and painful death. <laughs> it's definitely a spider this time. <laughs> This place is old, there are spiders, or worse, one of those gross prehistoric leggy bugs you should check. Just open one eye, make sure. Your life could be in danger. 
flick it with your hand or move your shoulder, no one will notice. These dummies are definitely scratching. Are their eyes even closed? Maybe they're watching you. Did they drop a spider on you for fun? Is this even a retreat? <laughs> Despite the intense, excruciating prickle that demanded attention, meditation helped me embrace that minute chance that the sensation would pass. Every time I survived, I felt lucky to be alive in that room, listening to other people breathing rhythmically through noisy nasal passages, and that one guy who was definitely snoring. <laughs> like the kid who must stop sucking their thumb, not scratching the itch was how it started for me. After the silence was broken, we were warned that the world would feel like it was moving at warp speed. People talked faster, walked faster, colors were brighter. It was jarring. I felt like the kid at their first hockey game wearing noise-canceling headphones. <laughs> the day I returned home, I sat on my couch enjoying the silence that wasn't really silent. I could hear the occasional car speeding by well above the 25 mile per hour, uh, mile per hour residential speed limit. I could hear the hum of my DVD player emitting a low, staticky hum from the mechanics powering the timer I'd set to record so you think you can dance. <laughs> I could hear, I could also hear an oddly invasive metallic wrenching sound nearby. I would have found the noise irritating and unbearable before. I might have jumped up to investigate and scowl at the perpetrators. But at the time, I was just able to observe it as a sound that exists as I exist. And I didn't even make fun of myself for thinking that. <laughs> My phone had been locked in a drawer with everyone else's at the retreat for the last 10 days. I hadn't checked any social media, text messages, or voicemails yet, so I powered it on. Notifications chimed loudly. There were a few missed calls and a handful of texts from friends asking for proof of life but there was a lengthy note from my boyfriend that caught my eye. He said that he hoped that I enjoyed my trip, found some peace, and that he didn't think we should date anymore. <laughs> he said other stuff, but that was the gist. <laughs> I sat, observing the feelings as they arose. <laughs> I felt irritation. <laughs> my jaw tightened and my temples drew together. I relaxed them. Instead of firing off a hasty response, I ignored the voice telling me, it's a dick move to break up with someone by text after a silent retreat. Then I registered a sound of indiscernible yelling and tires screeching. The cacophony rose and subsided in a universally transient wave. I thought, that's a sign. I felt pleased that I was taking this so well. And then I thought better about feeling pleased because that seemed like ego. <laughs> Almost immediately, someone started banging at my front door. The voice in my head said it was my boyfriend with a boom box and an apology. <laughs> I ignored that. Someone was yelling my name though, but it sounded like my neighbor, Joe, a piano repairman with two, with two kids. He was high pitched and out of breath. I thought about walking faster, but I hadn't yet regained the ability to rush. When I opened the door, he immediately turned away, pointing toward the back of my house. He started talking fast, loud, and running. I followed as best I could, not grasping his meaning. Turns out, two guys in an old white pickup truck had stolen the outdoor condenser of my air conditioner. 
I could see that they had sawed the pipe connecting the unit to the wall. <laughs> and I remembered that awful, screeching, metallic sound. <laughs> hmm. Despite its size, the units are apparently easy to steal. Desirable for about two pounds of copper coil, a street value of 75 bucks, depending on the market. A depressing exchange for a unit that would later cost me $2,000, plus labor. As I stared blankly at the concrete slab where my condenser had lived peacefully for the better part of 10 years, <laughs> multiple neighbors gathered. They must have pitied my lack of reaction because they raged on my behalf, recounting the harrowing discovery and confrontation. One neighbor, a mother of five who grows kale in her front yard, had run after the truck, yelling and screaming for vengeance. I thanked her, but I couldn't muster the righteous indignation that everyone expected. I wondered, how desperate two guys must be to frantically saw through a half inch thick metal pipe and lift a 100 and, uh, 150 pound condenser onto a truck while being chased by a 40 something housewife in garden crocs. <laughs> the ever present voice mocked me. Well, <laughs> this is clearly a kick in the teeth from the universe to show you how dumb it is to expect sitting on your ass for 10 days to fix your life. We could have been in Aruba. What a joke. Hmm. But I knew better by then. And that night, I slept better than I had in ages. Deborah Bass, ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Bass.